Well, welcome, welcome to the Headless Dam with Cloudinary Bootcamp course, lesson number one, our first lesson. Woohoo, I'm excited about this. An introduction to digital asset management, today presented by Sam Brace. He's the director of customer education at Cloudinary. If you do want to learn more about him, I had a great interview with him. It's located in the introduction section of this course on headlesscreator.com. So just go there and check it out. It's a really cool interview. Uh, now, with that said, Enough of me talking. You're already bored with me. I got Sam here. Sam, welcome. Glad to have you here. Thank you, Marcel. It's wonderful to be here too. I'm going to go ahead and go away. If anybody has any questions, I'll jump in and ask you, Sam, uh, but it's all yours. Excellent. Thank you. So here today, let's give you some of the details about what a digital asset management system is because in corresponding and following lessons, we're going to find out more about more of the finite details, possibly details around implementation, best practices, tactics. But to understand some of those best practices and tactics, you have to understand what this is in the first place. So what a digital asset management system is, first of all, in many cases, it's going to be provided as an acronym to you, as you'll see, DAM or DAM in this case. And of course, a DAM system is a digital, meaning, of course, everything is comprised with digital content. Keep it as simple as ones and zeros there, but also images, videos, audio files, templates that you might find within your computer. Those can all be considered assets. And of course, an asset is anything of value. So that image that you have as your homepage header, well, that's a valuable asset. Maybe that video that's getting you lots of attention on YouTube and other streaming platforms. Well, that, that could be an asset too many different things of many different sizes and shapes and formats can be considered an asset. And of course, management, you're trying to keep something organized. You're trying to make sure that people can easily find it. And it's not just you trying to find that content. It might be people of many different roles, many different places within your overall team, maybe outside of your office, maybe in a global setting. So when it comes to management, those are the three aspects that you'll be considering when you come to digital asset management. Now, one thing to note is that DAMs have been around for a while. Frankly, before the internet was even a concept, digital asset management systems were around. And because of that, when we're talking about files that are digital and we have no central repository for them, we don't have necessarily things stored in space where people can readily go, Everything's stored on everybody's computers or at worst shoved in somebody's desk that's a floppy disk or a CD in that case. So as you can see in the beginning, there was chaos. It was very hard to find files when you needed to get something and you were in one office and the file was somewhere else. Getting it, using it truly was a pain. And because of that, that started the overall trend of how do we get all of this information to be combined and centralized into a single space where all teams can access the content. And that's became the version that we have here. So early dams, they ultimately were databases. And if you think about what we're talking about, a place for files to be centrally stored, you might be thinking to yourself of things like cloud-based storage. Well, okay, yeah, like I've used Amazon S3, I've used Google Cloud Storage, I've used Google Drive, I've used things like this. But if we think all the way back to that, of course, it was not meant to be used by anybody except a certain type of person, which is called a damn librarian. Of course, as asset management systems became digital, sometimes they had fun names like cyberian for cyber because that was a term that was used readily at certain points of the internet's usage. But it made sure that people could find files very powerful for a certain type of person, but also very complex if you didn't understand how to use the systems because sometimes they didn't have user interfaces that were meant for anybody else that had extensive training, such as a damn librarian or an administrator, depending on who you're talking to and what type of field you happen to be in. But what that also means is that security for it wasn't great. It was always on premise because cloud-based, internet-based stuff is something that was happening after the, the overall dawn of digital asset management systems. But of course, today that's not the case because now we have everything is commonly software as a service when you're talking to any digital asset management writer. 
And the good ones, of course, have lots of flexible to use APIs in that case. It also means that you would be able to use your browser, being able to log in through Chrome or Firefox and be able to do everything you need to do. You don't have to necessarily install any software to be able to utilize the digital asset management system, nor once again, is it cloud-based? It is cloud-based. It is not gonna be on premise in those cases. It is also providing lots of search and filtering capabilities because what's happened with the changes over earlier to modern dams is that we wanna ensure that we have access for all team members, regardless if you are that dam administrator or wherever you're on the marketing team or you're a developer that's helping to maintain the content for a website or a mobile app. Maybe you're on the creative team and you're gonna be working with photo ready content, meaning that it's ready to go. We've already done all the filtering, we've done all the color correction. We just need a central space to store it so people can easily retrieve it, bring it up and bring it down. This makes sure that people can easily find that content through lots of different types of metadata fields, lots of different ways to be able to pull from the embedded meta, metadata, maybe a structured form of metadata that your team is able to set. But it ensures that everything can be automated, everything can be easily found, and it works for all different flavors of team members across your entire organization. So things have definitely evolved in the positive with digital asset management systems. Now, one thing that you'll find in common with most, if not all, digital asset management systems are some of these key business characteristics that I'm gonna be covering here. The first one is focusing on consolidation. As we talked about, things are no longer going to be in you know, Jenny's hard drive. They're not gonna be shoved in Sally's desk drawer as floppy disks and CD-ROMs. It's gonna be where we can easily find all of the different files, but it also is where if you think about it from the perspective of a lot of the things that are covered here in Headless Creator, like content management systems, or things that have a headless nature to them, it is where we're able to consolidate a lot of those different efforts into a one centralized spot, rather than having to say, well, these efforts are going to be living in WordPress, and these efforts are going to be living in a different content management system, or these ones are going to be in Google Drive. You can start to see how things can get siloed. If we make sure that everything is in one central spot, acting as a single source of truth, we're consolidating all of our different systems and trying to have it so that way you have one that acts as the hub for all assets when it comes to storage and organization management, back to the M and DAM, but also ensuring, as we'll talk a lot of more about more a little bit later, is how we can integrate a lot of those very important systems like a content management system or a product information management system for a PIM system, if you're involved with e-commerce, to be linking to that dam. So that way the dam continues to act as that single source of truth, but then can be used for all of the different purposes and needs that you have in your organization. Also, one big aspect compared to other file storage systems that you'll find out there is an idea of governance. You want to ensure that there is a certain form of access control and permissions because there are going to be certain team members that only need to do certain things with certain types of files. Maybe they need to only work with one particular campaign, but you don't want necessarily to have them to be able to rename the folder or rename the files. You don't want them to be able to delete the files. Maybe some of those files can be downloaded to their computer, but we don't want them to be shared in terms of their URLs being available on the web or being able to be published inside of a website, a mobile app, or anything else. This is how you can really make sure that certain people can do certain things. So only certain people can see the billing details, certain people can pull reports, certain people can work with certain types of files. And as we've shown, which people have the ability to create, to edit, to delete, using a lot of the common terms that we're used to when it comes to web-based and mobile-based publishing. Now, what's also really big about this is that this also ensures that there's a level of workflows that can happen with a dam, where you might have a team that's involved in uploading files at bulk, getting everything from a photo shoot or from a certain campaign into your digital asset management system. But then there's a team that needs to make sure that all the right files have been organized, have the metadata been applied to them, the right tags, are they in the right folders? Do people have the right permissions to access them as they should? So there is a level of governance that happens to be there. And I'm sure you've experienced governance in some form or fashion, whether it's in a content management system, 
But the differences that you'll find with a content management system's governance compared to a DAMS is that a DAMS isn't always about publishing to the web, which normally a content management system is. You are focusing on publishing a page, a post. You're trying to ensure that something is going to be wrapped around a certain level of HTML and CSS when you're working with this type of work. With a DAM, web publishing isn't necessarily always the first and only thing that's associated with it. It might be using digital asset management for print-based publishing, or maybe something that's going to be delivered for the media for broadcast purposes, not necessarily always for websites and mobile purposes. So you'll find that there are many different roles that you'll find with digital asset management that are not always tied to the overall aspects of a website or a mobile application. Also, of course, if you are cutting down the amount of systems that you have and trying to consolidate, as we've said a little bit earlier, ultimately that should help eliminate costs. And if you do find that you have to have three or four different file storage systems, you might be able to consolidate all of those into one. And that could be your digital asset management system. And because of that, as long as it fits the various needs of your team, then it should work. And of course, anything that's headless because of that, you can always make that work for your team and have a much easier way to tailoring it to the various needs and wants of the team members across your entire global organization. But it should be said, it probably is very easy to understand how if you are eliminating different sources and silos, that cost should ultimately come down, even if you are ending having to purchasing a new digital asset management system as part of the cost consolidation efforts. Centralization. As we talked about, that dam for assets, images, videos, audio files, templates, they should all be a way to centralize and consolidate. But centralization is a big theme when it comes to your global teams. You probably have it where you have at least one more office outside of the one that you are working inside of, or at least you have a global team members, or you have remote team members or contractors. You don't want to have it where oh, we can only access it because of these permissions or those settings or where they happen to live or their IP. Always what this is going to do is everybody should be able to access the files any given time on demand. It's not tied to on-premise in any way. And what this also does is that it makes sure that you can localize certain aspects to it where if we want to ensure that the way that things would be delivered for your team in England versus your team in America versus your team in South Korea, you can absolutely make sure that you have certain levels of metadata, localization, different types of things that can be tied to that. But centralization is a big, big key of this is we don't want to have it where people are finding the files in different spots for knowing that if it is an asset and it is a value by being an asset, it should be found in our DAM, our single source of truth. Now, teamwork. I've touched upon this a little bit with governance, but what this really does let you do is make sure that there's a strong workflow across multiple teams, cross department, because if you have people that are bringing in those files, you might still need them to be photo ready, picture ready. You might need to have them be color corrected. You might need to have some zhuzhing when it comes to contrast and brightness and maybe focusing on the right thing to crop to. Those are all things that can be part of a workflow where you can have your team uploading. If you have integrations with your dam into commonly used photo editing software or graphic design software, such as Photoshop or Illustrator or InDesign, all of that can be done and then can even be brought right back into the dam with this nice push and pull mechanism. And that's where the teams don't have to give up the wonderful tools that they already are using. They might be using our Photoshop. They might be using Illustrator, wonderful tools that Adobe makes. Maybe they're using Canva. Maybe they're using Google Slides. But there should be a nice way to easily bring things back and forth so that way people can go ahead and update as they need to. And most digital assets management systems, as long as it's a downloadable file type, such as a PowerPoint, such as a CSV, such as a... JPEG, a PNG, WebP, AVIF, whatever you happen to like for your image formats, it should be able to be supported so that way all team members can work with the files and get them to be production or publication ready, depending on what you determine that to be. 
And Sam, I'm going to jump in real quick here because, and we're going to be covering this in other lessons in the future, but beyond all those people to think about is also like 3D files and video files and raw formats. There's a lot, you know, we usually think of just images and, and just uh, basically images, basically for the web, right? But there's a lot that you can store in a digital asset management system beyond just images. That's absolutely right, Marcelo. And that's something to really keep in mind is that we're, we're trying to be as simple as possible when we say asset. It's a, it's a file of value, right? But to Marcelo's point, if we're talking about a 3D file that shows all of the different angles of your automobile and you want to have that as an interactive experience on your website, your mobile app, by all means, that is something that a digital asset management should not only be able to store, but also, once again, should allow you to organize. So that way, it's not just finding it by the file type of a certain type of right. 3D modeling that you might have, or a 3D image, or, you, or a spin set, whatever you end up using for 3D. But it is also a case where you should be able to have metadata, tags, have additional details on maybe publication statuses. All of that should be able to help it keep organized. Otherwise, right. it just becomes file storage. So. It's absolutely true. So don't just think about this as images. It can be much, much more. Very cool. Thank you. One thing to also point out here is consistency. And if you think about this from a marketing and branding standpoint, it starts to make a lot of sense where we don't want to have images or videos that are off brand that represent maybe the old logo or the wrong color scheme or if we're using the wrong font or maybe it's actually an image of something that we don't sell anymore and we don't want to make sure it floats onto the web. Or even more so, maybe it's something we're not ready to sell yet because maybe it's still in production, like that amazing new shoe that people are gonna be buying over the holiday season or that hot new video game that people are gonna be amazingly excited about but we don't want the world to know about yet. A good system will allow for consistency. So certain types of files, will have the right branding, the right treatments to it, have the right crops, the right styling. But also, in terms of access, we'll make sure that certain files can be and certain files can't be accessed. That's a big, big point of this. And this will ensure that through automation, presets that you can be applying, it's going to ensure that whoever the team member is, they don't even necessarily need to know that they are part of an automation workflow or they are using an upload preset to make sure that everything is brand ready and approved. But as administrators, in many cases, you can get that all set up and ready to go. So there's lots of considerations here when we talk about consistency, but it is a big, big reason why we want to ensure that people are using a dam because it makes it ready for all of those various use cases. And I want to emphasize here the single uh, uh, point, uh, uh, single source of truth, sorry. <laughs> uh, that is really important, right? Because especially, and we're going to be having lessons on image transformation, where they work on that just one image only, and then they transform it for the different channels. We're going to be going into detail on those. But sing, uh, single source of the truth allows you to, like you mentioned, update that logo once and everywhere it's used. If you suddenly change, you rebrand, right? Now you have different colors or whatever it is. Uh, you just change that one image, single source of truth, boom, all the channels will be updated. And that's a, that's a very important thing. Absolutely it is. And that's the wonderful thing about if you do keep everything at a single source of truth, if for some reason I have the logo in a different spot, in a different system, it's not going to have that same level of automation. But if you do treat it as that single source where the logos, the branding, the colors, everything is kept in this one single area, it makes those updates that much easier, so that way everything is happening just as turnkey as Marcelo just articulated. Right, because you can have like a logo on, on multiple landing pages, on your website, on your mobile app, on a newsletter, and now you have to change it everywhere, right? So single search of truth, I'm a huge pusher of that, even just in headless CMSs, so it's, it's a big thing, so cool. Absolutely. Very good point, Marcelo. Now, this one is actually a really, really big one, and you can see here metadata you probably understand some aspects of this, being somebody that is tied to Headless Creator, you're probably tied to some of these various details. But metadata in general can mean two different things, depending on how we're talking about it with a dam. There can be technical metadata, and that's typically data that's about the asset itself and sometimes comes embedded with the asset. So that could be detail about what camera did that person use to make that image or that video? Did they use a Nikon, a Canon? Did they use their iPhone? Did they use a... Android phone, what did they use? And what date did they take it on? And what size is that? And is that a JPEG, a PNG? Is it in raw format? Is 
all those details are technical metadata. It's about the file itself. And in a lot of cases, it's very hard to change those things because those are things that happened at the date and time that the photo or the image or the video was captured. It's about the details of what happened with it. And because of that, this actually becomes searchable files. Because if I said, show me all of the pictures that were taken inside of my dam, but they were taken or created on today's date, I can find all of those. And the same situation, I can find them in terms of the video duration, the location that they happen to be in, if your camera is accepting GPS and EXIF data, that's going to have that. Now, descriptive metadata is typically things that you'll be adding after the fact. And in many cases, it's things that the device would never know, such as what is the title of my overall file or the file name or the public ID, depending on who we're talking about in terms of vendors, they might call it one of many things. Who is the person that took that picture? Is it Sam? Is it Marcelo? Is it somebody else? Maybe we need to find all those files because maybe it's part of an overall set. Maybe it's a product ID or a SKU if you happen to be involved with commerce, you know, in terms of actual product files that happen to have a certain character of letters and numbers and mostly numbers that would be able to identify a certain file. Maybe it happens to be things around certain keywords and the keywords can be many things. It could be things that are more contextual about the image. So if you're taking a picture of me, it might say short hair, it might say navy polo. And those are going to be keywords to help identify this particular content at time because we'd want to find all the speakers that had short hair with navy polos. But it could also be things that people would not know just by looking at it, like what happened to be the temperature of the room or what happened to be something, I mean, that's kind of a silly example, but things about, you know, what exactly le lesson in the headless creator class did this happen to be? That could be a keyword. And that's not something that even an AI-based tool could figure out because it's something that only the content creators involved in the course would know in terms of DAM. But ultimately, as you can see, inside or outside the asset, things that the device or the capturing device would be able to know versus things that are tied more to the creator, maybe with some AI assistance, but ultimately, metadata is a big, big, big reason why you want to be using a DAM system and keeping your files organized. It's one of the key ways for organization to take place. Quick question for you, because uh, you just hit AI and machine learning. Uh, where does that fall under? Would that be under descriptive metadata, technical metadata, or would that be like its own separate thing? Great question. In a lot of cases, what we find is it does fall under the descriptive metadata side. So kind of the back of like the context of the image. So mm. that example I gave where I said short hair, navy polo would be keywords. There are a lot of essentially integrations that you'll find with digital asset management systems or ones that stand alone, like Google Vision or Amazon Recognition. Right. I know that Microsoft has a few that they run through their Azure program as well. And it's going to look at the overall content, whether it's an image or a video, and apply contextual tags to it. And like I said, it's not going to know that this was lesson one of the Headless Creator course, but it would be able to pick up certain things it found that it's been able to pick up through machine learning. So certain details of saying, like, I happen to be a man, or I happen to be in a room where I'm using a microphone. It'd be able to right, pick those or things the up. color, right, right, right. And that would be added as part of that descriptive metadata. Exactly. And sometimes it's something where that can happen automatically through the workflow, where if right. I'm uploading a file, we can make sure as I'm uploading the file, it's calling one of those AI services and bringing back that content as metadata or tags to help with the search processes. And yeah. I'm a big believer that people search for things in many different ways. So having those AI-based services only adds additional value for the overall search purposes because it's hard as a DAM administrator or a librarian to anticipate the different keywords that people will need to use to find a file. So the more assistance you get from services like those that Google Vision, Amazon Recognition, um, Amaga, as examples, can provide, it can only add more value to the overall service that the DAM provides. Right. And we're going to have a, uh, we're going to go into detail. One of the, I think one of the last lessons in this bootcamp will be specifically focused on AI and machine learning. So stay tuned for that. Thanks, Excellent. Sam. Absolutely. Now, integrations, we just talked about this a little bit, but when we're talking about integrations, the key thing that I think is a huge value for a damn system is, as, back to our point, single source of truth. It should be the hub. 
And if we think about it, we should have essentially little legs that are coming off of it or tentacles or whatever you want to call it. But it should be powering the images and the videos and the audio files that are being delivered onto your website. So that means there should be a direct integration between your CMS and your DAM if this works out the way that it should. Because if I have all of my files stored in my DAM and I can say, okay, I can search for certain ones based on their metadata, their tags, their creation date, their certain folders, I can easily go and say, allocate these five pictures and bring them into my CMS. So that way I can use them in the page or a post or a gallery that happens to be there. And that way we're not having to worry so much about duplicate tags or overlapping details that happen to view the CMS and the DAM. The DAM acts as a single source of truth and it's acting, pushing this very quickly to the CMS. CRM systems act the same way. I've seen many cases where we want to ensure that we have great images of certain properties that have um, hotels, restaurants, attractions that have lots and lots of data in our CRM system of contacts that we need to be regularly talking to. Being able to push that information through, absolutely, that's a great mechanism. I'm seeing that done with many different leading CRM systems. Creative tools. Also, I've mentioned this already, but it's really big to focus on is that you don't want to tell your creative team to do away with the tools that they love using. You should have it where your damn system has a direct integration, maybe through APIs, maybe through something even more turnkey that's built completely in-house that corresponds to the two systems. Absolutely, whatever it is, it should be where you can easily push the content to that creative system. They can do all the work they need to do there and they can go and bring it right back in with all the changes or they can use it for other publication purposes there as well. But they should be able to always know that whatever they need in the current best state, they can pull it from the dam. And this is really oh, important uh, to emphasize, right? Because uh, for example, saving, let's say you're in Photoshop and instead of saving locally, you save to the dam directly. So that way another uh, designer can work off of that. And again, now we're pointing back to that single source of truth for production files, not just for delivery files. And that's a really good point, because if you think about the example you just gave, where instead of saving locally, well, if you're saving locally, you're almost kind of taking the damn concept back to the Stone Ages, back to the right. point when things were on premise, that it's that CD-ROM that was shoved in Sally's file drawer. It's, you don't want to have that happen because, you know, your computer crashes, I, you know, get stolen, whatever. All of those files are completely non-available. But if we make sure that they're always in the dam and we're not pointing to other cloud-based systems either, it, everybody knows to go to that one single spot. Yeah, and it's that. actually a lot harder said than, it was a lot harder to do than it said as well. Because one thing that Marcelo, I found with all organizations that are trying to adopt a dam is that you have mm -hmm. people that are bought in. And then you have people to say, but I still like using Dropbox or I still like right. using my spreadsheets that I have saved on my computer on my desktop. And so almost as one way to think about this as you're going through the checks and balances of what you should be doing to prepare for this damn system is try to almost pinpoint who those naysayers would be that like the silos that they have and try to come up with arguments to make sure that they feel comfortable in the new environment where you want them to be at. Yep, definitely. Now, one other area that you're going to see here, of course, is product mar information marketing systems. If we're trying to keep track of all of the different products, especially those that are tied to e-commerce, you want to make sure that those SKUs that you have there, all the product information details about the color, the fabric, the make, the model, they're stored there. But if you have corresponding metadata fields in the dam, you can actually have that nice push and pull mechanism as well. So that way you can even have them as read-only files technically in the dam. So someone can manipulate them in the dam and push up bad information to the PIM. There's all sorts of ways to be able to make this to work. But the big focus here is that you need a dam that will be able to link to all the things that you work with that everybody likes working with, as long as it's not meant to replace the dam because the dam is supposed to be the single source of truth. There shouldn't be multiple sources of truth by any means. The last big point that I'm gonna make here is about analytics. As we're seeing with our continually changing economy, with our continually changing business needs that are happening within the space, that our technology space, that is, analytics become more and more vital. We need to be able to prove, prove our return on investment, our ROI. So this means that we need to be able to show how many people are adopting the system sometimes. It's maybe about overall usage of the system. 
who's uploading, who's downloading, how many uploads are happening, how many downloads are happening. Something as simple as that. But if you have systems that are also tied to bandwidth, that are tied to web delivery, you can help to see are people optimizing those files? Are people making sure that that 30 megabyte picture that's perfect for that billboard isn't necessarily being used on your homepage header? There's things like that that can actually be tied into it. There's also lots of cases when we want to be able to pull analytics on things that are called zero results. What files are in my system that have no tags, that have no metadata, that maybe are very hard for people to find. And as DAM administrators, you can help pinpoint those so that way they start getting utilized more. Also to ensure that that great file we spent weeks on getting to be picture perfect, pixel perfect, it doesn't find its way just to the bottom of the storage scrap heap. So there's lots of analytics that need to be able to pull, but constantly finding a way to report off of this data is vitally important to the success of your organization if you decide to start bringing them into a centralized digital asset management system. I would challenge people to start tracking issues with marketing, meaning what I mean by that is, oh, look, we have the wrong logo here in this newsletter, and there's this wrong logo here, and the colors are wrong here. I'm assuming if you start tracking that kind of stuff prior to a digital asset management system, and then start tracking that post the digital asset management system, that to me would be a great number to track to get a good ROI, right? So look, we went from a hundred issues that we had before to like five issues that we had this time, right? Marcel, it's a great point. And it's actually something we do at the company that I work for, where our project uh, management office, they have something they've said called the brand police. And they have it as kind of an anonymous form. <laughs> Everybody say, if you see a bad logo floating around on the web, on our websites, you don't have to raise your hand publicly. You can even just privately report it, but it helps to add to that number and how we're cutting that number down. And right. to your point, centralizing that, but also trying to find mechanisms to prepare for the ultimate move to the single source of truth will be something you can easily track and be able to start to say, what is our return? And if it's just staying on brand, that's a big, big part of it. Yeah, huge. Great. Sam? Well, actually, Marcel, you're right. That, that covers everything that I wanted to cover here today. So thank you for having me. You've done great, man. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. People can uh, reach out to you via the email right there um, that they see on the screen. Uh, and also to learn more about you, they can go check out that great interview we did because we spoke about challenges and pros and cons of implementing a dam and how that goes. So check out that interview, with Sam. So Sam, thank you so much. Marcelo, thank you. This was wonderful. And thank you to the rest of you. I hope you enjoyed the first lesson of this bootcamp. We have many more lessons, like we mentioned. I believe lesson number two is going to be about um, uh, integrating. We talked about integrations, getting a, a, a DAM system integrated with a headless CMS system. So stay tuned for that. That's going to be really cool. So I do encourage you to continue watching um, all of the lessons so you can learn more about digital asset management systems. And remember that if you want to get uh, certified, you'll be able to by taking an exam later uh, when we're done with this uh, boot camp. Uh, just make sure you use the study guides, which you'll find under the bonus section of this course. And as always, get a hold of me right there, marcello at headlesscreator.com. So until the next lesson, have a great one, everybody.